Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today. I've got a lot of information to share with you. If you don't know me, my name is Jared Showers. I'm with Home Basics Real Estate. I'm a real estate broker. Uh, we do property management professionally as well, and I do a lot of real estate investing. And I wanted to share a system with you today on how to qualify a potential rental applicant. There's a lot that goes into this. And I'm going to share with some things with you today that are kind of our secret herbs and spices, if you will, on making sure that you guys achieve a really good result as you utilize this system that I'm going to describe to you today to qualify potential rental applicants. This isn't a teaser video. We're going to go deep into the details. It's going to take a little bit of time, so stick with me, but I think it'll be very, very worthwhile. This is not legal advice today. Some of the things I say may not apply to you and your state um, and in your situation. So I just want to make that disclosure. But uh, I've been doing this for a long time. And I have placed personally over a thousand tenants. And during my career as a property manager, I've had a very, very low eviction rate. So probably less than 10 of those 1,000 tenants, 1,000 plus, I would guess, at this point, have I had to do an eviction on them. So this system works. This is uh, something I've developed through a lot of trial and error uh, over many, many years. And so if you will learn this system and apply it in your business, whether you're a professional property manager or a landlord with one property, you're going to have some really great results. Okay, so what's really going to help and help make sense of this today is that wherever you're watching this or listening to this, hopefully we've got a couple of attachments to the show notes. We've got a rental application right here, and this is a rental application that you can use. It's a generic rental application, so it doesn't have any of my information on it, but I think it's pretty good, and we've developed this over a lot of years. And then I also have what's called a tenant discovery report. This is also going to be very important for you to follow along with as I go through this information. So hopefully you'll be able to download those, maybe print off a copy, take some notes, jot some things down. When we uh, are trying to evaluate a person to see if they're going to be a good fit for our rental property, we're really looking at, at three things. I mean, you could break it down to, a, to three different things. Number one, we want to make sure that they're financially capable of paying you the rent on time every month. In a very real sense, we're extending credit to this uh, applicant. Uh, just like if they're going to apply for some store credit at a department store or a credit card or a, a home loan, we want to make sure that these people are financially responsible, that they've got decent credit, that their debt-to-income ratios are in line. We're going to talk about that today. Secondly, we want to kind of get an idea of whether or not these people are clean, that they're going to maintain your home, that they're not going to cause a lot of damage. A person who does a lot of damage uh, can actually be a lot more costly than somebody who doesn't pay rent. So this is as equally important as the financial piece of it is to make sure if we can get a feel whether or not these people are going to take care of your place. And then the third thing is we really want to make sure that we're not putting somebody in one of our rental units that's going to be a threat to other residents, neighbors, to you yourself, that we want to try to eliminate the liability of something like that happening. So we'll talk about that today. Now, the first place to start is developing rental criteria. You need to decide what kind of uh, person you're going to allow live in your, uh, in your rental property. Okay, So these could be things like what's their minimum credit score? What's their debt to income ratio going to be? Are you going to rent somebody that has criminal background? Whether or not, whether or not you're going to rent somebody who doesn't have any kind of a rental history. I mean, these are criteria that you need to figure out. I'm not going to supply that today because this is something that you're going to want to um, uh, figure out yourself. There are lots of places online that you can go and look at sample rental criteria, including my own website at homebasicsrealestate.com. Uh, so you can find a copy there, but, but really think hard what kind of criteria you want 
uh, for your own renters, okay? And that rental criteria should be in writing. It should be available to a, pot a potential applicant. Maybe you give it out stapled to a copy of your rental application. Maybe you refer people to your website to make sure that they see that. And what that's going to do is they're going to read through that, and some people are just going to say to themselves, hey, I don't fit this rental criteria, and it's going to weed them out. And that's a good thing. You don't want to take applications for people and uh, spend your time on somebody who's just not going to measure up to what your rental criteria are. So it's okay if they decide not to apply based on a review of your rental criteria. Uh, so what we're doing then through this whole process is gathering information and then measuring them against your rental criteria to see if they, if they stack up. It's very important in this process that you treat everybody the same, that you apply that rental criteria to applicant A just like you're applying it to applicant B, C, or D. In every case, it's very, very important to be consistent. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with this. Who should fill out a rental application? I get this question all the time. Um, just to answer that question, it should be anybody who's going to be living in the home that's over 18. Well, what about if it's a husband and wife? You should collect two applications. You should have information on both spouses. What if it's three roommates? You should be collecting three applications. All three of them should be completed and signed by each applicant. If it's an engaged couple and this is their first place, you get an applicant from one person and you get an applicant from the second person. If it's uh, mom and dad, maybe they have a couple of minor kids and then they have an adult son or an adult daughter living with them, you should get an application for the husband and wife and that adult child. I think you're catching my drift here. It's very, very important to collect an application from each person. All right. Uh, when you get that application, you're going to want to review the application with the tenant, if possible, maybe on a phone call or face-to-face, -face, and go through that and make sure that the application is complete. When we ask for things like a Social Security number or a date of birth or a driver's license number, we need that information to properly qualify that tenant. Uh, make sure that it's legible. Sometimes I get an application and I can't read the phone numbers, I can't read the addresses. So make sure that as you do that initial review, that you can read all of the information very critical that the application that you use has a signature on it, that they are giving you permission to go ahead and check their references, pull a credit check and a background check. That's really important that it's signed by each applicant. As you go through the application, you might determine that you're going to need some additional supporting documentation. And that could, and examples of those could be pay stubs, uh, bank statements, tax returns, uh, maybe documentation of some sort of government benefit that they're receiving, uh, documentation regarding child support. Okay, so if you find that you need some of that additional do documentation, this would be the time to collect that from them. We also want to make sure that we understand who's going to be living in the property. Uh, we want to know who the adults are as well as the minors. So we want everybody listed on the application that's going to be living in the home. The minors are obviously not responsible for the lease agreement, but we want to actually put them onto the lease as occupants so that when we do an occupancy check, we know who's supposed to be living there and who's not supposed to be living there. So that's really critical. There's some questions on this application that are just yes and no questions. Please take a look at those. Those are really important. They ask questions like whether or not the applicants filed for bankruptcy, if they've ever been evicted, if they're part of the, uh, in the military. There are provisions for military men and women when it comes to lease agreements. That's really important to know. We ask them if they have a, a pet, if they smoke. Those are questions that we want to make sure to review. And if we have questions about that, if they say they have uh, been evicted, you should have some follow-up questions for that tenant. Okay, at some point in this process, and in personally, we collect it up front. We want to get a copy of their driver's license. We actually make them submit that with the application because we do want to positively identify them uh, with that driver's license. That's really important. Now, I charge an application fee. Some municipalities don't allow you to do that, but there are costs involved in qualifying an applicant. Hard costs, like the cost for a credit check or a background check. In my case, I'm paying people, uh, staff members, to uh, uh, qualify people. And so it costs me money every time I take that application. 
And so I'm collecting an amount that's going to offset some of those costs. Unless prohibited by local law, you can do that and you should do that so that you have the resources to be able to adequately qualify this person. Now, as we look at the application, one of the first things that I do when I um, go about uh, gathering information is I check what the landlord references. This, in my opinion, is the most important section of the rental application. Uh, we want to talk with the current landlord and we want to talk to previous landlords because they're going to be able to have a perspective that the current landlord doesn't have. They're going to know if the person gave proper notice, that they followed the checkout procedure, that they left the place clean. They're going to know whether or not they had to withhold money from their deposit. They don't have anything to lose by giving a, an honest, straightforward reference on that applicant. Whereas the current landlord may color that, that reference a little bit because they want them to move out. And they don't have that perspective of how they left the place. So talking to previous landlords is absolutely critical. It's important to note on the rental application that I have a date in and a date out. So dates that they actually lived in the place. And I want to recreate that last few years and make sure there's not a gap. So if I see a year that's not accounted for on the rental application, that's a red flag. So I'm going to question that applicant to see why there isn't a rental reference there where they were for that year. And sometimes they have a good excuse. They might say, hey, we moved in with mom and dad. I didn't think you'd want to talk with them. Well, indeed, I do want to talk with them and make sure that uh, that they were there for that year and verify that. Because I've actually found tenants who are trying to, av uh, trying to um, avoid giving us a rental reference because they had a bad experience, they had an eviction or something like that on their uh, their record. So look at that date in, date out. Look at what the rent has been that they've been paying. So sometimes I'll get an application and people have been paying $750 a month. Now all of a sudden they're applying for one of my homes that's renting for $1650 a month. There could be a good reason why they're jumping up in payment. Maybe they have uh, a new job. They just got out of school. Now this, they're, in, they're working their first job. Or maybe they've got a roommate that's going to help pay for that. But sometimes I'm a little concerned when somebody all of a sudden goes and puts another $800 into their monthly budget. So look at that payment. We call that payment shock. Now, if you guys will pull up that tenant discovery report, uh, you download that. That's really important. Let's go through that a little bit in the landlord interview section. The first step is that you're going to want to call that landlord and you're going to want to have the landlord actually verify the information on the application. And I would let the, app, the landlord do that. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. And then there's questions that you can ask them. These are not fully formed sentences, but there are some cues here that help you to ask some questions that are really important, like pay rent on time. Have you ever served them a notice? Uh, have you ever received complaints from other tenants? Do they smoke? Do they have a pet? Etc. You can read through that. And as they answer, I've got columns there where you can check uh, yes or no or add comments that that landlord reference may have given you. So I've got a current landlord and space for two previous landlords. Then I have some comments, and you can actually write some quotes down there in that comment section. So I love when I call a landlord and they say, these guys were awesome. They were some of the best tenants I've ever had. I would totally re-rent to them again. And uh, I love to hear that kind of thing. You might note if a landlord was very careful about how they worded certain things, if they were hesitant to give you a good reference. Uh, maybe they were sort of beating around the bush on the qualifications of this applicant. Note that. And, uh, you know, they might just be worried about saying something that's going to get them in some sort of legal trouble. But a lot of times when people have had a bad experience with a, with a tenant, they're going to be very careful on how they phrase their rental reference. Um, so let me demonstrate how this call could occur. So you, you call the, the landlord up on the phone. You say, hey, this is Jared with Home Basics Real Estate. I received a rental application from Joe, and he lists you as his previous landlord. I just need just a moment to ask you a few questions. May I, may I proceed? Okay, people are busy. You want to be courteous and make sure that you're handling this professionally. 
And so the, then I go right into this. So where did they rent? I want the landlord to tell you the address of the property so that you can cross-check that with what's on the application. Because if it's a fake reference, and I've come across fake references, chances are that applicant and that fake reference have not coordinated to the level that they're going to be able to spit out an address that matches what's on the application. Asking them what dates, to the best of their recollection, they rented from uh, that that applicant rented from the uh, uh, landlord uh, the rent amount. So what I'm trying to do is pull that information out of that landlord rather than giving them that information. That's going to go a long way to spot a fake reference. And then you just continue on with that conversation. You say again, let me ask you a few questions. Did uh, Joe pay rent on time? They say yes or no. Did you ever have to serve any notices to Joe? You know, so you just go through that. When you're done, thank them very much for their time. Make sure you've noted that and move on to the next landlord reference. It's very simple. And if you use this tenant discovery report, it's going to prompt you all the way through that phone conversation. Okay. Now, what if a tenant owned a home? We get homeowners all the time, people who generally own a home. Uh, applying for one of our rentals. And I love people who have that home ownership mentality because they know how to change out furnace filters. They know how to maintain a lawn. They generally show some real pride of ownership of where they live. And they're just renting because they moved to the area or for some other reason. But it's difficult to get a landlord reference. So what are some things we can do? Um, one of the things I really like to do is if they sold their previous home, I like to find out who the realtor was and call up that realtor and have a conversation with that person. And some questions you might ask them is, you know, did they keep the place clean? Were they able to maintain the home and show ready condition? Did you have problems selling the home because of the condition that it was in? You know, how are they to work with? And you can get a reference on that. And I've gotten... Um, I've gotten good information out of realtors who've helped me make a decision and, and really been very positive about the applicant. And I've gotten information that's caused me to have real concern about the application from, from, from realtors. With digital photography and people wanting pictures online of their homes when they're selling it, if you do a search on that address, you're going to find maybe a Zillow ad or if you have access to your local multiple listing service, um, you're going to be able to find pictures of that home and you're going to scroll through those and you're going to see how well this person took care of their home. And it's going to be very evident whether or not they were clean people. And so look at those marketing photos. It's going to be a really good sign. We want to also make sure that the home has sold. A lot of times I get people applying for a rental when they actually just have their home under contract. They might have put it under contract yesterday and now all of a sudden they're applying for a rental. Well, I want to make sure that that home has closed before I'm signing a lease with them. Uh, that's going to be really important because oftentimes sales contracts do fall through. And so depending on where they're at in that contract, you might be very careful on actually signing the lease. You can process the application, but be, be hesitant to sign that lease too quickly. On their credit report, we're going to look at their mortgage history. We're going to see that their mortgage been, has been paid on time or not been paid on time. So you can use that uh, information. If they don't have a rental landlord reference, you can use that kind of information to help them uh, get qualified. Now, oftentimes we call landlords, we can't get in touch with them, or the applicant gives me an application and they don't have the landlord listed there or their phone number. And they say something like, oh, I lost the phone number or I can't get in touch with that landlord anymore. I put that back on the applicant. They need to track down their previous landlords. That information is so critical for any person trying to make a decision to rent to them. And so I do put that back on them. If I call a landlord two or three times, I leave messages, I try text messages, I just can't get a hold of them, then I'm going to call that applicant and I'm going to say, look, I've got to put your application aside because I cannot uh, get in touch with your landlord, and I've really got to talk to them before I make a decision to rent to you. And that's okay to do. It can be frustrating to try two or three times, but you know, as soon as you put that back on the, the tenant, a lot of times they're tracking them down and they're getting them in touch with you. Now, if they were living with a family member, uh, one of their rental references is their mom and dad. I still call them. I still ask those questions. But you have to kind of take that for what it is. It's a family member 
And, uh, you know, they're probably going to say good things about them, but still go through this process, ask those same questions and document that. If their only rental references is, is from a family member, there may be some concerns and you may need to require some additional things from that applicant. All right. So please take the time to call your rental references. It's always amazing to me that, you know, when we have had bad tenants in the past, you know, we get them on their way, we turn over the property, and I never hear anything from uh, about those tenants in the future. Uh, nobody's calling me for landlord references. Nobody's bothered to check uh, with me, and I just find that so surprising. Be better than that. Make sure to call those rental references. Okay, next thing, employment verification. You're collecting information on the application about their income and about their employment. Uh, we want to look at how long they've been on that job. We want to see that these people are stable. So when I see people bouncing around, two or, they have two or three jobs in six-month period of time, that does show some instability, and that's very concerning. If somebody's been on the job for 10 years, I love to see that. And so look, look at that length of employment. Um, what can we actually ask the employer? Really, all you're able to ask them is if they're employed with their company or not. And some employers will just cut you off right there. They'll say, yes, they are employed. And that's all the information that you're going to get from them. However, it doesn't mean you can't ask additional questions to a landlord who may be willing to answer some things. And so on the tenant discovery report, again, the first step is to verify with the uh, employer um, the name of the business, their start date, and the position. Again, trying to spot somebody who's giving you a fake uh, employment reference. And I've had that happen many, many times. If you're getting that information from the employer and it matches what's on the application, that's a good sign. So ask them if they're currently employed. Verify their income. Now, some supervisors may not know what the applicant's making, and so they may need to refer you to a, an HR person. If you can't get that information from the employer or supervisor, then you really be, better be collecting a pay stub and documenting what that person's making. Some additional questions we like to ask the employer then is, and we just hit them with this sort of randomly. Do you, do, does the employer take a smoke break? Or does the, the applicant uh, take a smoke break? And so I've had employers say, yeah, he's, you know, we allow one smoke break every two hours, you know. And so you'll get that information. And if you don't allow smokers to live in your property, if that's one of your rental criteria, then that's a bad sign when an employer lets you know that. Did they show up to work on time? Um, can you recommend these people? I mean, that's getting into sort of some personal references that you can get from the employer. But I think it's fair game. They may refuse to to answer that question that's okay but i like to ask those now what i love to hear from an employer is yes joe's been with me for you know 10 years he started in the warehouse he's now worked himself up into a management position we really like what he's doing for us he's just going places i mean i love to hear that because that's going to indication gives an indication of the caliber of person that we're dealing with so again just to practice you you make the phone call person picks up you say hey this is jared with home basics real estate we just received a rental application from one of your employees and i'd like to collect a um, employment verification uh, on him can you tell me what the name of your company is can you tell me what the position is that he works and can you verify how long he's been there so if you start off with that line of questioning you're going to you're going to get those answers and then again ask them if they'll verify the income amount very easy phone call to make. Please make sure to tell them up front that you're only going to take a minute of their time uh, because these people are also very, very busy. Next thing that we want to take a look at. Actually, let me, let me return to a couple more things. We get people all the time that are self-employed. They're running their own business. And so you can't call up an employer and say, uh, you know, and get this information that you're after. And so what, what can you do? Well, we can look at tax returns. That's fair. 
Uh, we can look at bank statements. We can look in their bank statements specifically for deposits that are made and tally up in a month's period of time and maybe over three months worth of statements how much money is coming into their account. We can look at their bank balance. So self-employed people generally will carry a little bit better bank balance than maybe somebody who's getting a paycheck every two weeks to make sure that they can cover their bills. And so we want to see that there's uh, some room in there. Uh, they've got a little nest egg built up maybe in their bank account. So don't be afraid to ask for those additional documentation. Maybe if they have some clients or customers that you want to contact and ask to get some sort of business reference on them, that could be some helpful information as well. All right, so uh, let's move on to the personal references. Now, people all the time say, Jared, why do, you, why do you even have personal references on the application? Most tenants are going to put somebody in there that, uh, on there that's going to say good things about them, and I hope that's the case. But there's been some really good information that we have been able to glean from making these calls to personal references. So first off, who should the personal reference be? I like to have somebody on there that's not a family member. I like to have a personal reference of somebody who uh, the applicant and this person have gotten together for a game night at their house or a barbecue. So this is, uh, I really want somebody who's been in their home and knows these people personally. Um, because they have an idea of how clean they are with the house and how they're maintaining the home and you can ask them some questions like that. So again, if we turn to that Tenant discovery form, uh, first questions, you know, how do you know this person? How long have you known them? Have you ever been to their home? That's the information that we want to find out. Does the applicant have pets? This is where I have found so many people who have been dishonest or untruthful on their application where they mark that they do not have a pet. But I call the personal reference and they say, yeah, I was over there last week and they have this really great golden doodle and he's, uh, you know, we love to play with him when we go over there. Okay, that's a red flag. Now, I also have found where somebody's gotten rid of a pet and they're not bringing it to the new place. So you call the applicant up and you verify that. But uh, that's where we find that out. Also with smoking, again, I don't rent to, my clients don't want me to rent to people that smoke because cigarette smoke is very difficult to get out of a home. You may feel differently. Maybe you have some homes that are you know set up to be able to accommodate that. But when we ask a personal reference if somebody smokes, we get that information all the time. And that may be the first time that we're hearing that. As we've gone through this other uh, these other questions and interviewed these other people, this might be the first time we're hearing that they smoke. And so you're going to want to record that and address that with the applicant. Um, when I call a personal reference and I ask them a question, well, how do they do at maintaining the home? Is it clean? Is it organized? And when I get a personal reference that gives me a little hesitation, a little pause, and they say something like, well, you know, they have three kids. It's really hard to keep up with cleaning up after them. And and I, that makes me a little bit concerned because I know lots of people that have three kids, more than three kids, that keep a very clean home. And so if you, if, if you get some hesitation there, that could be a sign that maybe they're not doing a great job with cleaning up that home. All right, so you call up that personal reference again. This is Jared, Home Basics Real Estate. I received a rental application from Joe. He lists you as a personal reference. I'd love to talk to you a little bit about Joe. And then you proceed with those questions on that discovery report. Very, very easy to do. Okay, once we've gone through these interviews with all of these references, then I'm going to pull up and, and everything's looking good there. Then I'm going to actually spend the money for a credit report. Now, again, as I talked about earlier, we are extending these people credit in a very, very real sense of the word. And when uh, I have uh, mortgages on the properties I own and I've got clients who need to make a mortgage payment. It's really critical that we're receiving that rent every month on time. And a credit report is going to give us some indication of whether this person has been very responsible with their credit. So yes, we are looking at the credit score. That's important. You should have a minimum criteria for your credit score. That might be, you know, 575 or 600. Anybody less than 600, you may not rent to. I mean, that's up to you to set. But sometimes people have bad credit 
and we really want to dig into what the, the credit pattern is. So if I see a credit report that's got a bad credit score or a low credit score, but I see that their car payment's been paid on time, they've got a little credit card balance, their student loan's been paid on time, but then I look down and I see a bunch of medical collections and I ask that applicant, hey, tell me about this. And they might say, hey, our kid was in a really bad accident. We got behind on some medical bills and they showed up as collections. I have a lot more sympathy for that situation than looking at a credit report and seeing a pattern of missed payments, uh, charge-offs, um, things from like, uh, you know, back in the day I used to see uh, collections from Blockbuster Video or, you know, Comcast Cable or Verizon or something like that. That's really, really concerning. So don't just dismiss somebody based on the credit score. Look into the to the reasons why that credit score uh, might be low. You're going to be able to look at the credit report and see collections, late payments, charge-offs, judgments, whether or not they've had a bankruptcy in the past. Uh, those, that's the information you're looking for, and you're going to need to be able to manage uh, some risk there. It's also going to tell you what their current financial obligations are. I don't have them list that in the rental application. You can if you want to, but I want to look at their credit report, and I want to total up all of their payments, and we're going to use that to calculate their debt-to-income ratio. There are sources for you to pull credit reports. Um, I use Western Reporting. Uh, you could use them as well. Uh, but there's a number of different sources online that you could use to pull somebody's credit in this situation. If they have bad credit and um, you feel like you want to take a risk for them, uh, with them, then maybe there's something else that you could do. Maybe you could get a co-signer. Maybe you could collect some additional money up front. If somebody comes to me and they have two or three good rental references and all the landlords said, hey, they paid their rent on time and they've got some bad credit, you know, I'm probably not going to be as concerned about it. And so uh, look at the whole picture when it comes to that. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is a debt to income ratio. Um, this is a measurement of how much of their monthly income is going out towards debt. And so we want to look at their credit report, total up all their monthly obligations for credit cards, car payments, uh, student loans, whatever the case may be. Total that up, then add the proposed rental payment. Okay, so if the rental payment's $1,000, you add that to their other monthly debt, then you divide that by their total monthly income. And when I and that calculates a debt to income ratio, and when I see a debt to income ratio that's higher than about forty percent, I start to get nervous. Forty five percent, you know, again, part of your rental criteria is to determine how high you want to let that debt to income ratio go up. Past about forty five percent, I pretty much need to, uh, I you know, I need to deny that application based on that, unless there's some other uh, factor that I can uh, sink my teeth into, so to speak. Okay. Um, make sure, a, a point here is to make sure that you are including all of the household income. So sometimes the application may not be, they may not disclose that they're receiving some child support or they're receiving some sort of medical, um, you know, some sort of social security benefit or something like that. So if their debt to income ratio is a little bit high, ask them if there's any other household income you would like to to consider and make sure that they haven't left something off. And so sometimes I've found that to be the case. You're going to put that uh, credit score and that debt to income ratio calculation right at the top of that tenant discovery report. There's a place for that. Now, next thing, criminal background. Um, as a landlord, as a property owner, as a property manager, you are taking uh, upon yourself some liability here when you place a tenant. So let me give you an example. And these are real examples. They haven't happened to me personally, but these are real examples that do happen frequently. If you put somebody into a, an apartment building and that person gets into a fight with uh, the resident next door, <clears throat> beats them up, sends them to the hospital, 
you potentially could have some liability with that, especially if you ran into that person knowing that they had some kind of a, an, a, a charge of uh, assault or other violent crime in their background check. So you really want to get an idea of who you're renting to and make sure that they, are, that they are, um, have a clean criminal background. Now, there are a lot, of credit, a lot of criminal background checks that I pull. They might show something that happened 10 years ago. Maybe it was just a misdemeanor. Maybe they got caught smoking some marijuana. I don't condone that. Uh, you know, it's not legal here in Utah in most cases. So I don't condone that, but it might be different in your area. The point is, you might have a little allowance for that. If it happened 10 years ago and it was misdemeanor, it was a small, small theft or something like that. What I feel like are um, no-goes that uh, we can decline somebody on is if they have been convicted of uh, any kind of sexual crimes, any kind of real violent crimes, especially if prison time has been involved with, with that, because the worst nightmare is for you to put somebody in there who's had something like that in their past and maybe they molest the girl next door. You will, you will be sued. And so uh, be very, very careful uh, with who you're putting into your rental. Um, and, and I think pull, spending the money on that criminal background check is really, really important. All right. Other things that you can do. I think social media is fair game. Some people disagree with me on that, but I will run them through uh, maybe Facebook, LinkedIn, something like that. Um, look at their Instagram account because you can tell a lot about people. Just the other day, we had an applicant said they had no pets. We looked up on their social media and they had like two dogs and they were legitimately her dogs and she just lied on the application that she had them. You might see other things on the social media site that might turn you off, okay? Basing your decision totally based on, you know, off of that information, I'd be a little careful of that, but I think it's fair game. We also do a Google search of that person's name. Now, if they've got a very common name, just make sure that whatever the results are that you're able to, you know, make sure it's that person. But, uh, you know, on a, a number of occasions. In fact, just recently, just last week, we ran an applicant's name through a Google search and we saw on our local news uh, website that they are being investigated for multiple crimes. And that was a big turnoff for us. Uh, we don't want to be involved with that, especially when there's some ongoing investigation there. I've, we found a number of other problems uh, where somebody has been uh, charged with and convicted with um, crimes that shows up on a Google search. You could drive by the rental home that they're currently living in if you wanted to and see, especially if they have lawn care responsibilities, how they're doing at maintaining the yard. You could actually go have them fill out the application in their home. You could see them in their native habitat. You could uh, sit there at the kitchen table while they fill that out. You could at least go collect that application from their home. So those are some other things you could do to just sort of get a little bit more information and wrap your mind around this particular tenant. I think it's a great idea to meet face-to-face -face with a particular uh, potential applicant. Um, nowadays, with online applications, uh, we're not uh, doing as much of that where we're meeting with people. But I used to meet with people in this conference room all the time, go through their application. Um, sometimes their kids would be super well behaved. Sometimes their kids would be tearing up my office and literally writing on my wall and knocking down my computer screens and things like that. I've had that happen. So sometimes when you spend a little bit of time in their presence, uh, you can uh, you can get to know them a little bit. Uh, when they used to, when I used to meet with people, I'd have my secretary go out to their car and look at their car. I don't care what the make or model or how old it was, but you know, if they look in the car and there's McDonald's wrappers and trash all over the place and it's disgusting, that's probably the way they're going to treat your rental home. So you can do some other things to really get to know them. So once you've gather, gathered all this information, you put it on the tenant discovery report, then you, again, measure them against your rental criteria. Do they fit your rental standards? If they do, great. Move forward to, with uh, signing the lease. If they don't, 
then what can you do to get them qualified? You know, in this business, we're all about just managing risks. And so if they have some negatives on uh, their application, can, is there a way maybe to uh, compensate for that? Maybe bringing in a cosigner, maybe additional months rent up front. Uh, so look to see if there is a way that you could feel comfortable renting to that person. Oftentimes, uh, some of my best tenants just have not quite fit the mold, but we've been able to, um, through a cosigner or through additional months rent, uh, we've been able to uh, get them into the property and they've turned out to be excellent renters. All right. Is the time and effort really worth going through all of this process? Uh, I will tell you 100% it is worth it. Predatory tenants do exist. There are people that are professionals at going from one place to the next, getting qualified, moving in, and then not paying any rent, uh, damaging the place. They know how the eviction system works. They spend as much time in that place as possible. And sometimes if a, an, with an inexperienced landlord, they might be in there six months to a year before you're able to get them out. So this is so important. And when tenants know you're going to put them through this kind of scrutiny, a lot of those professionals will not even apply if they know that you have required rental criteria, you know they're going to do a credit check and a background check and call their landlord references. You're running a business, and it makes really good business sense to know who you're doing business with. So it's very much worth doing this. Bad tenants are costly. Uh, they cost you lost rent. But those that do damage to your property can do damage in an amount that far exceeds the rent that you might lose. So making sure that you're renting to people who are going to take care of the place is critical. You know, sometimes bad things happen to good tenants. We've had great tenants that totally fit our rental criteria. They have a loss of employment. They go through a divorce or separation. So they have major life events that come up. It's those good tenants in that situation, a lot of times what they're doing is they're packing up and they're leaving. They're cleaning the place. They're helping you re-rent it. Um, and so, yes, we've had a lot of people who have not been able to fulfill the terms of their lease, but uh, they've been great to work with through this process of turning it over to a new tenant when they have a major life event. And so when you do all this work up front, you find those types of people, when they have a bad thing happen, you're going to still be, you know, you're going to make a good situation, you know, you're trying to make a good situation out of it. I think when, when we as landlords, we go through this process, it raises the level of landlording in our community. And I think it just keeps bad tenants out of our, out of our uh, communities. It really makes owning and investing in rental properties uh, profitable, fun, um, bad tenants really get in the way of you buying more properties. A lot of people have had some experiences with tenants that have caused them to want to sell their rental properties. I just hate to see that. And so if you'll learn this system, learn how to qualify, put good people in your rental units, you're going to be profitable. You're going to want to buy more. It's going to be a much better quality of life for you as a landlord. Listen, thanks for sticking with me. There's a lot of other issues that we could be talking about that you need to be familiar with, and perhaps we can do some further training on. But fair housing laws are something that you need to understand, especially if you have more than three properties, three or more properties. Very, very important. Emotional support animals. How do you deal with that? That's a big hot button topic right now in our industry. Uh, multiple applicants. If you get applications from multiple parties, whose applicant do you process first? You need to know that so that you don't get yourself into some trouble there. Uh, follow this system. Fill out this discovery report in full. Make sure that you go through all the steps that you learn the system and that you consistently apply it to every one of your applicants. And if you do, you can expect the same kind of results that I've had in my career as a property manager. Uh, really appreciate your time today. If you've got questions, uh, you know, send me a message. I'll do my best to answer them. But uh, I really hope you found this uh, helpful, and I just wish you best of luck with your rental properties.